actually a colleague of mine, her name is Helen Livingston. And that program, if we get a chance to talk about it individually even, it's really a great program that gives students post-baccalaureate experience and then they go into medical school. And students' achievement after that post-baccalaureate year is just absolutely astounding. They do really well with credentials that would, as they try to get into medical school, wouldn't get them in probably any other school. And yet they come to and do really well. But today I'm going to talk about CompSA milestones. AAMC has established another phrase, another buzzword to talk about clinical competence, and that's talking about instruct in trustable professional activities. However you want to phrase it, see, even before the AAMC got involved in trying to help schools develop a list of these EPAs, most of the medical schools were trying to find standards for competence as a student progressed along a pathway to competent clinical competence. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Florida State, just because it's important to know the setting, the school is unique in that we have a central campus in Tallahassee. And the first two years of education occur in Tallahassee. And then the training occur on six regional campuses. Total enrollment of the school is 120, some of the size of church is four. Each year, one eight third year students go off to one of the regional campuses, and then the regional campuses have responsibility for 23rd year and 24th year students for their training. So, in looking at clinical competence, we're sitting in central administration in Tallahassee, and we're trying to assess the competence of our students using faculty who are practicing in a in most cases outpatient setting and they are not paid by the I said that wrong they're paid by the medical school for the teaching they do but most of the time they're practicing medicine in a primary care setting uh, as we looked at assessment of competence we've been working on this for about four years when we started out we created a list of milestones we listed 53 things that we thought we needed to judge students' progression in their development of confidence in these 53 areas. It's an overwhelming number. And when you get numbers that are too big, the tendency of anybody who starts judging is to just pick a level and they'll say that's what they are instead of trying to discriminate between the 53 items on that checklist. So we decided we had to narrow that down and then we added another level. We decided we will focus on 20. We picked 20 of our 53. We actually did a thing where we did statistical tests to, to see how these things clustered the 53. And we found that doing factor analysis, you can narrow it down to about 20 domains. And so we picked within those 20 domains. We also added to our assessment another standard. We thought that as faculty in the, and the these are clinical faculty doing this judgment of confidence this year in three and four where this is being done. Most MDs would have a perception of what it would mean to be a student who would be below a third year student level with just a little bit of experience. They know how to pick out those that are not even a baseline, those that you would identify as a brand new third year student those that are progressing, those you'd say they're already acting like a fourth year student, their knowledge base is that high, or they really have achieved resident level. And we thought without a lot of faculty development for all of our, so we have almost 2,300 clinical faculty scattered across the state of Florida, they all would have some index which would be fairly similar in just at identifying that basic level of achievement. So we added to our assessment of competency that puts the general overall level of development. Then we have them judge each one of the 20 competences with a question, yes, no. Can they do it or are they unable to do it? And then if they do do it, see we added another set of factors. 
We don't ask this on every single one. We ask, ask it about six times on a form. In that general area, what's the consistency and quality with which they're performing these skills that we've identified as competencies? So, big change in recent years. We narrowed it down to 20. We added consistency and quality. And then, just that overview, what's the level of progression? And that last one, as I looked at the data and tried to figure out how you interpret it all, that's, that really is the base upon which you can set up all the data and it makes sense to you. Can and you I'll show you that. Can you ask a question? Sure. Right. And uh, so, not, not this one. Not, yes. So, I, I didn't do that. So, you um, pick up students at the third year level? No. At the third, third year level. Third year. All, is, all I'm talking about today Partnership. is looking at students in their <coughs> clinical clerkships. Third year. And, and third and fourth year. Fourth? We're looking at third and fourth year. What I'll present today is all on the third year. I'll just limit it to that. But we're looking at these in their third and fourth years, in the required ones. Electives, when you know, students go off, a lot of times they go off to externships, they have no control, no way to really train faculty to do that. Now, as I say this, see, we are going to implement this coming year assessment of competence in years one and two. But you, as you define what you want to measure, which specific, specific milestones, you gotta pick things that are appropriate to years one and two, and then look for some progression. Even there, I think maybe something similar to the logic of this, like a brand new first year student progressing Beginning second year, and I have no doubt when our clinical faculty looks at this in year three, there are students who come on and I know it occurs. That student is really bright, they have the skills, and so when they grade them on these comps, they say, it's already like a fourth year student. But very few get that. So it's a thing to remember, very few. Uh, a diversion, but an important one that I talk about, it's not Robert about. Uh, there are faculty, whether you're talking basic science or clinical, who will look at students and nobody can meet their standard. Absolutely nobody can meet their standard. So when they rate students, students are going to not achieve the highest standard on anybody's scale, in their minds. There are faculty, and of course, states I tend to use names. And I get in trouble for it because <laughs> Jose, I won't give you his last name, say, he has never seen a student that ever had a flaw. And so you get these inflated evaluations. So you still need, we call them education directors, you might call them clerkship directors here, who have to filter the comments and they know, you know the people who just everybody's glory. And you know the ones who have high standards to the point where uh, every student's going to look like they're weak. But when you look at a collective where you follow the data, so you start making sense out of even the appearances in the data. So then when we look at the stage of development, see it's a five point scale, as I've already expl explained that fully. It's pretty easy for faculty to pick up on the cues of where they are in that development. Resident would mean that's a pretty rare student who really is progressing to that level. And I'll, I'll show you what goes on with our collection of data. Now, in our COMC domains, see they're under headings, and probably most of you know nationally, as people define the competencies of medical school and are trying to assess students' achievement of skills. Uh, we've had probably every medical school have their own set of competencies that they think are appropriate. Uh, there's an old joke, if you've been to one medical school and seen how they do it, you've been to one medical school. Because every one of us do a little differently. So each school has to decide what they want to judge. And I've just given you phrases here, and you, see, you see it in the handout. What we put under that heading of patient care. And at a first level, all the judgment is, can they do it or not? Just can they do it or not? And some of these things, they become skills that I actually highlighted in yellow, see these ones that are really higher level skills. Uh, from the phrase, you'll understand what I'm getting at. 
prioritize a differential diagnosis. How, how good are they at doing that? That's a skill that every physician over their lifetime will probably get better and better at doing it. But when you're judging, see, I think by giving that other scale, we're not expecting to be the best that they can be. We're expecting them to be a progressing third year student that's midway through the year. And we're gonna have some who do it so well you'd say, I kind of like a resident in that skill. In knowledge, we have a couple items come under knowledge, some couple items come under interpersonal skills, patient-centered behaviors. And so the ones I highlight in yellow just had better discrimination. We do the statistics on that to make sure that. But can they do it or not? And then we actually add in these things consistency and quality. And in patient care, the consistency and quality are under gathering data, clinical reasoning, patient management, use of medical knowledge, what's the consistency and quality in doing that. Um, and I'll give you an explanation of data just now, take a little diversion again. So sometimes when you look at the responses, you'll find that consistency and quality usually are pretty close to one another. But sometimes the faculty tell you exactly what they mean. Consistently poor. So you have to, you have to, have to look carefully at the data and make sure you're not missing something. When we did consistency and quality, and I'm sure any of you who worked on evaluation forms struggle with this. So we actually decided a nine point scale. Let them use the scale. Uh, in any survey that I've ever set up, you'll find that most people, because they're dealing with really smart medical students or really good faculty, tend to compress the scale and they only use the top part of the scale. But I would argue if you start compressing it, all you do is you keep pushing it higher on the scale. So uh, when you look at our data, it's pretty clear the nine-point scale is actually working. But in fact, see, 35% are scoring at an above-average score. Uh, so Or nine, I mean, is an above-average score. 35% of the students are graded in that category. About 35% are graded in that they have a score of eight on this nine-point scale. That seven, 20% of the students are scored on that scale. And then six to one, for our students who get a one. If you didn't have it on the scale, so you wouldn't realize how bad they really are. So I think the scale works. But just looking at the scale, see, a score of below, six or below, you know you're dealing with the bottom 10% judgment on that scale so I argue that we keep this the scale and if you're going to have historical data so you can't keep changing your forms every single year so we for the last two years we've used exactly the same scale and the, exactly the same the outcome overall is a score of eight so when, when you judge this you can indicate the level of consistency quality when you see nines that's an above average score. You see an eight, it's about an average score. And when you're in that lower range, you just realize how bad they're being rated. So this actually shows part of a data table, and this is what I'm showing under, this was at the end of the year, this is the number of students who are rated in each one of these categories. Point is not working real well, so, but anyway, you can see that when you get down six and below, it's a small percent of the students but the lower scores are still used for most of the items on the list. When you're setting up tables on a spreadsheet, some of you may do this, you can actually make them look graphical because you can do conditional formatting. It's a way to set up a spreadsheet. And so, being a spreadsheet addict, say, I set this up so that you can see on this table See, these are rotations. There are six rotations throughout the year. This is showing data for the second half of the year. When you see students are being rated at below a third year level or at a new third year level, see these numbers up here that you, you don't need to read them. You can just do it as a graph. These are all scores that on average for the students who are getting that rating, 
they're in the bottom 10% of the class. And when you look at the resident level, the highest level in all of these categories of competence and consistency quality, see, these people are out here, people with a five are right in this green zone, they're in the top third of the class in that performance area. So we really do see progression as you go from students are perceived at a third year student level, they don't show good consistency quality to those who are at the resident level are very good. And you can just see the pattern. So when you get to the final rotation, we still have students who are perceived as a new third year student. And they're really being rated low on the consistency and quality in each one of these categories. So I really think the data does give you a consistent way to look at it. And when you use this conditional formatting, you can read this like a graph. So for rotations, so I think, let's say rotation D, right. in the beginning of the third year, or in the middle of the, in the end, does it make a difference? Yes, it does. If we evaluate the students. And I'll show that graphically. Thanks. So lead into one of the things I'm going to So this, this just emphasizes rotation DC. The people who are new are getting low consistency quality evaluations collectively. Now, if you look at their development, see this shows you for each rotation, for six rotations, we have six rotations or six different disciplines that they rotate, rotate through in their third year family medicine, internal medicine, OB, pediatric, psychiatry, and surgery. This is looking at rotation A, and it just tells you what percent of the students were identified as new third year, as experienced third year, already appearing like they're fourth year, and at a resident level. And so as you look at this, you can see there's a striking decline in the number of students who are still perceived as a beginning third year student. So as you look at that, you realize we have about five to 10% of our class who are not showing progression. Those are the students say, that we have to really think about. Are they showing enough confidence that you're ready to let them go on to their last year of training? Okay. Once we organize the data this way, see, I think you can make some critical judgments. Now, with our <coughs> campus model, we don't have just one dean of student affairs or one educational dean that's overseeing all of the students. You can really start getting the data and looking at it critically and have a campus dean, and they really do this anyway, they really take responsibility for their 20 students in each year, trying to make sure that all of them become competent when you give them the data organized in this way, you can have meaningful conversation with the students and point out uh, their inadequacies. And see this number who are now perceived as fourth-year students, some students come in. You, you have them in your classrooms. You know that some are really bright from the beginning. But we grow to more than 40% now are perceived as students who are in fourth-year level of performance. We should have all of them there, really. But uh, to me, it just says that the system of scoring is really working to show this gradation. So when you put together, see, some may still have, some are over here with experienced third year, they still have things to learn. But more than half, of, half the class now is perceived as at that fourth year of resident level in the training. Ones we've worried about, the ones in yellow. So <clears throat> this actually is students who receive the grade of honors. Last night we had a conversation about who gets honors in our system. See, Florida State set a standard that the NVME score has to be at the 75th percentile or a student can't be given honors. So the knowledge base that's determined by that NVME exam is a big, big deal. Maybe the point of really being unfair. With what we now have in place with the assessment of clinical skills, I think we could go back and maybe identify some of these students who just it never probably are going to consistently have high scores on those subject exams. But their clinical uh, 
experience, their training, and how well they perform clinically really puts them in a category where we have a way now of better assessing those who, based on clinical performance, should be considered for honors. But the gatekeeper see is that score of the 75th percentile will be eligible. So students who don't have that would never get honors. This is the profile for students who get honors. And if you look in the first rotation, see, there's quite a few students who look like new students or transition students who still get honors. But I think what happens in this case is the faculty know the students brand new. This is their first rotation. Their expectations are not that high, and so the judgment can still be made honors. But when you get to the last rotation, see there's only 2% of students who were given that designation of new student who got honors. Now, part of that can be the judgment of the education director says, well, we know that John Smith is never going to think that a student has progressed. And so I think some of the people who are still getting honors with that lower, that they're transitioning or like a brand new one, maybe some who are stuck with an evaluation from a tough back member. Most of them say, have moved into this, they're really performing well. And, and this is, is what is rotation C? Pardon? What is rotation C? What is that? Rotation C? Mm -hmm. Oh the, this is just Yeah, I know. This would be on all different rotations. Yeah. This is mid year. Yeah. This is mid year. What does it mean? Yeah. Oh no no this all is all of this. All all of this, this is, is everybody who's been through three rotations. Because everybody's been through three rotations. I noticed they always see would have more experience. <laughs> I don't so know. This why. is just no, the these, are, all, the these are the rotations through the year. Yeah. So they're mid mid year and they've seen it. Half of the courtships. See. Mm -hmm. Now, see your question actually was good because it took me to another thought that I wanted to bring out. See, by the by the third rotation, you've pretty well established trends of performance for students. Mm -hmm. So the campus deans, when I presented the data, last year to them they said can you provide us with all these tables of performance so that we and the students will get a report mid-year so I can meet with them have them do a self-assessment how we've been scored mid-year and I now can plan the second half of the year to tell them the things that they're lacking mm -hmm. so we've done that but I also put with it information on a OSCE exam, we call it a formative OSCE, acronym FOSCE. So mid-year we do a clinical assessment in an OSCE setting. You all know what OSCEs are? And we, we use that, see, and I put the two data together. My last slide, and my last slide, I'll talk about that. Okay. See, here's a progression. People get honors are progressing. That's the big point. Can I ask, so the <coughs> separating the <coughs> these competencies from the grades. Yeah. So so we do, in the basic sciences, we call them non-cognitive evaluations. And a lot of them are these competencies that we're trying to measure. And the, because it's not associated with a grade, it's just an evaluation to come back to the students. I don't know that they take them seriously right. and are really concerned how concerned are the students with this information that's coming back to them when they're hearing that a that a faculty member is thinking that you know even though you're in your fourth or fifth rotation that you're you're performing more like a beginning third year student are they concerned about they're that? concerned about and especially say when you put huge value the campus deans in our institution all are required and the dean when i talked to him about it this year said you need to make sure they do it they have to have a meeting with each individual student on their campus and review this but now they got the perfect thing because the student has their copy of their data the dean has the copy and when i talked to the campus deans they all were planning the same way self-assessment and you come in and you now explain to me how you think you're progressing based on what all the factors said. All this comes directly from the faculty. We give them every faculty comment along the data. 
So you obviously did some type of training or faculty development so that the faculty knew how the scoring process worked. Yeah, that's actually been going on, see, for about four years. Mm -hmm. But we cut back on the number of items. I think anybody who's doing this kind of assessment with a lot of items has to be careful. Mm -hmm. I'm not having too many or just faculty to shake their head. Um, What's it? So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the honor is students. Uh, what about the, the other students that are not honored? The last, last graph that you showed, you saw the progression of the honor students, correct? Yeah. What about the not honor? The one before, get? see, showed everybody. Ah, okay. That, I know that was everybody, it. but I... I could have done it taking out the honors. I didn't do that. Okay. I may, I may do that. So I probably had the same good time. Idea. <laughs> But probably See, but most, most of the people who are not progressing actually are the people who didn't get on it. That's the fact. Question. Uh, you have multiple evaluators for each of those students. Oh, I'll show you that in just a second. So that's why you get on yeah, it. So See, so what do we provide? I provide to the campus deans, central administration, and the students a statistical summary. Tell them who did the rating, how much time they spent with them, summary of all their scores, specific scores, and every single comment. Every student gets every bit of it. So there are na narrative comments that go with Narrative comments go with every one of these things. And they see who said it. We've actually pushed that process along. Because now, as soon as the education director, that's what we call on our campus, we got one person over each discipline, we call them education director. We have six clerkship directors scattered on the six campuses. So the education director, one person still makes the final decision for their discipline. And that adds consistency. See, now this shows a profile of a student at the end of the year. And it shows the name of the rotation, internal medicine, then P, then OB, then surgery, psychiatry, family medicine. In our family medicine, almost every student is one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member. It's not hospital-based. There's no intervening at residents or anybody else. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Psychiatry, this person spent time with three different people. They can, I took the name off for this, but they can see who said it, because they know anyway. And they would see their rating of the performance. And so when you look at this particular scale, see this student starts off, uh, one of the people on internal medicine, this is real data, felt that the student was at a resident level, oh, but he only spent two weeks or less with them. Maybe on a good day for the student, maybe he didn't spend enough time. But you have all this, and the education directors see who does the rating. But what you see in this case is a nice transition from seeing him as a new year, experience, fourth year, resident. This is, this is a perfect, uh, increase in the competency indicated by our scoring system for a student. It's a sample on the students. Quite a few students will see patterns like this. See, you know, That's what you're doing. You're just looking at the patterns. Because there can be variability between clerkships, on the clerkship rotations. Uh, I'll say it this way. On pediatrics, we often see male students who get lower scores than you expect. And maybe it's their dang attitude that gets in their way. But it's one of the glaring ones where a student really isn't interested and maybe they don't put the same level of work in. So you have to kind of take into account a campus dean is capable of doing that, all the factors. But they have everything to see the score. So sometimes you don't see a perfect pattern. But in general, see, students are progressing. Statistically, we know that towards a higher level of competences indicated by that level and then the consistency quality factors see this person when you look at the consistency and quality factors and could they do it these have gone up to this person has perceived by 100 percent of the faculty for these rotations the 20 items yes no part they could do it and then the consistency quality see averaged 87 percent over the whole year this person's really good. We're ready to go on. 
So, um, Dr. Ramo, yeah. when you're tracking, uh, we can call it maybe the trajectory, the progression right. of a student, which is more important than the individual data point, do you also meet with them in the middle of, of the year to, to, to evaluate the trajectory, or is it just towards the end? That's what I say, in the campus deans, absolutely. You have to meet at the middle of the year. Then the question that comes up is, suppose someone is stagnant, they're not progressing, and we pick right. this up in the middle of the year. What's the remediation plan? I'm going to assume, knowing your campus, that there's a remediation plan in place. The fact is, see, this this really lies in the hands of those individual campus deans. Central administration can, and we have a dean of student affairs and myself, we're reminding them of this, but really the entrustment in our institution, the responsibility lies in the campus deans. All right, so we have the campus dean in Sarasota and they notice that there's a plateau and the student's not progressing. What are the typical strategies that they would use to, to, to intervene at that point? It's, it's a trickier question. Well, you probably know it's a complicated answer because you're I do. That's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> See, there's some of our deans that I know do an excellent job and they will look I at their, the, I look at their I, I yeah, they will be looking at their electives and their, their scheduling their fourth year and they will adjust that to address their areas of inadequacy. Thank and then you can also pass on to the clerkship directors on those fourth year disciplines <coughs> areas of concern you wouldn't want to bias the faculty against the students so you got to be careful about what you say to the faculty but that clerkship director on that campus can make sure <clears throat> that the students paired up with a faculty member who is going to be conscientious in making sure the student is learning appropriately uh, i look at my colleague here on the right because i know he knows what i mean he knows in his faculty we're going to be the ones who just won't be satisfied with mediocre performance. And so you have to have this uh, trust in the campus dean, him working with his clerkship directors, and then also guiding them away from doing some things and forcing them to take an elective that's going to build on their skills or their need for enhancement of skills. The, the reason I ask is I'm, I, I'm sure everybody here is, is, is interested. We're trying to work this out about how we would accomplish it here, and, and that's the reason for my question. So, we'll think about see, we have a huge advantage with the campus being involved, just because you're you're dividing the responsibility. Yes, I, I think it's going to be very difficult for the one and then two to track them, especially if we don't have attendance policy. How are we going to track them? Um, no one said it'd be easy. I, I joke about joke to students about this all the time. Now I can't do it. Medical school was too hard. What well, was easy? Everybody. Could do it. So just because it's not easy, I mean, you got to think about it. But we have E and P committee at our school here. I forget what you call it. Progression committee or something. What do you call it? Our academic academic, yeah, academic committee that the judging students. say sometimes I get so aggravated. Our committee. They should be taking decisive actions on students who are not progressing. That group, 2C, has this giant oversight. Um, everybody's got to do their part. It's not easy. I think the biggest challenge is having, um, having opportunities to evaluate the students in these areas. If all you're doing is standing in front of the class and lecturing, you don't have the ability to, to do anything other than get a multiple choice exam. But if you're doing interactive sessions, like some of the courses do, where you're really interacting with the students, you get a better understanding of their ability. In line with that comment, see, Florida State this teaching in the third and fourth year is not done in the teaching hospital vast majority of the time. So the faculty aren't assessing residents and other people along with the medical student. It's one on one. So our faculty have a pretty good opportunity if they take advantage of it to see all these things actually done in a clinical setting and they really see what's your performance. I was just wondering if you applied anything similar to this during the first and second years in terms of mid-year evaluations and getting progression well see with a course like your doctoring course you call it doctoring we do too at florida state and in that course i really think there's the opportunity to do exactly the same thing that goes over the whole two years 
and in, in anatomy or one of the other courses or in your blocks of integrated curriculum, it's a little harder. But the LCB standard is we're at the mid-year feedback, mm -hmm. mid-year, mid-course. So we should be doing that too. But see, when you start looking at these things globally, and that's my big message today, <coughs> over the whole year, over the three or three, four year span, if we're seeing lack of progression, we should be doing it. If I just want to mention to our own faculty, Dr. Ramal, we have five longitudinal courses. It's not just the doctoring course. Mm -hmm. And uh, often there is a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring in those longitudinal courses. So even though they couldn't be done maybe during the, the, the didactic uh, 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 organ block systems, there's lots of things we can do individualized. Pri I just think in your heads the five longitudinal courses and how this could be applied in the first. I'm sorry. That's good. All right. So I'm just giving you more of the detail on the, on the spreadsheet page the way I set it up so I can look at this. See, this is that same student. This is just looking at each one of these areas in which they were judged on consistency quality. So when you get down to the latter half of the year, this student is getting the highest marks they could possibly get. This student's really doing what you would want them to achieve. They start out a little rocky, but in the end, they look pretty good. Uh, second phase, they, this is a student that comes in, the perceived weak early, you just look at the last ones over there, these red marks, see, they're in the lower 10% of the class. You just look at it graphically. Later, they actually they show that they can do these competences, but what's their consistency quality? And see, this just at the end of the year, like a experience 30. When you look at consistency quality, see, on the last rotation, family medicine one on one, the student did just fine. But the pattern over the year says there's serious problems with this student. I think the campus dean hopefully can see this. It's not hard to interpret. And then when you look at the things that the student individual marking, not just consistency quality, can they even do it? And you look on this one, see these are things that people perceive they couldn't even do. And of the people assessing, there's nine people who assess their student over the year, five of the nine said they can't do a uh, differential diagnosis. I think you have a clear message. There's something wrong with this student's skills in that area in particular. And some things are harder than others. This is just the other half of it. See, a lot of people see that they, there's some things they can't do. And the campus dean see me that meeting with the student mid-year, hopefully can be addressing it for the second half of the year. And at the end of third year, can look at it and say, we still have concerns. Okay, I'm gonna go to another place. So we give an end of third year Austin on that county uh, scaling in the third year by clinical faculty, everybody has it. At least eight of as many as 12 different people assess them. We've got 12 independent observers. On our OSCE, we have an eight station OSCE. We're gonna try to actually increase that to 12 just to get more sampling. But eight different people are assessing the student. Well, when you compare the two sets of data, see, how does this come out? These are people that were the best performers on the OSCE. This is ordered in OSCE performance. And so when you look at this half, that's how long they've been on the OSCE. Rings mean they're in the upper quarter of the class in each one of the areas that says so this one student had a bad station or two. How well did they do on, and see I put in here, performance in years one and two, their performance on step one, their step 2C K score. So all that's there. And then how well were they graded by the faculty in those areas of competence and consistency and progression? And this is just set up so as you read it, green's upper quarter of the class, white is in the second quartile, yellow's in the third. Uh, these students actually did okay, pretty good actually on their clinical ratings over the year. But when you get the bottom of the class, see, you got sampling on that OSCE, only eight stations picked to be representative. Here's the bottom of the class. So they are very weak on all those skills that are assessed on the OSCE, OSCE exam. And then how well were they rated during the year? Uh, the Red Sea, they're in the bottom 10% of the class. So the correlation actually is pretty good. 
between the scoring that they got on the OSCE and how well they did on the clinical skills. So the two, <coughs> the correlation coefficient is 0.36. So not a real high correlation, but a real positive correlation. And especially when you look at the lowest performers, <coughs> they separate themselves. This is what Dr. Emel, do you promote that student to the fourth year? If this were student a down here, right. Actually, the bottom student had been dismissed. Yeah, okay. The bottom student was actually dismissed. But that's kind of a random chance that anyway. We're not see we're not paying enough attention to the data yet. I honestly believe that. But this student was dismissed. What happens when you get a student like number six where you know it's like everything looks really good in one in one measure, you know, set of measurements, but then yeah. things else? See, when you're talking about the OSCE exam, yeah. that's a one-day experience. Right. It could be that it's just a bad day for the students. We have to take that into account. The students can, well, any of us, but just couldn't be in the right mindset when we take it. So when you look at somebody like this, when you say, uh, maybe it was a bad day, you just have to look at the student's overall record and make a decision. So the U.S. MLE score is really high. Right. The, uh, the other thing that you see with a few students some people have been involved in getting hospitals. Some think it's phony baloney anyway. It's all make believe because it's a pretend patient. And so uh, it's a really bad attitude to have, but some people have that attitude. But this could be just a bad day. Looking at this year, we gave the, the deans the mid year report. See, this is looking at OSCE exam. That's in the in the green bars. So this was the people who are the lowest performers on the OSCE, but this is how they were scoring on their clinical scores all through the year. So see and this bottom student again was a high performer, shouldn't be in this category, but our FOSCE is only three stations. So I, I think it has some major weaknesses and I've argued we need to really put the more meaningful assessment of where you have the data and use it mid-year, a bigger exam mid-year for that OSCE. So then you could get time to take corrective action, and especially as you think of ahead to them taking the clinical skills part of the US employee. At the end of the year, it's too late to do corrective action for anybody who's having trouble. But I just think you can again see our low performers through the, through the year were the same low performers on that mid-year philosophy. And the campus dean and the students have all this data for that meeting in the mid-year. A lot of these things are clinical skills. Are you picking up the professionalism issues outside of clinical skills? What it's in there. Too. there? Yeah. There's, there's an assessment of professionalism in a couple ways. One is eagerness to learn. And it's, it's amazing how much that eagerness to learn the weak students will have low scores in very of confidence. Professionals. So, so you have uh, uh, about nine penises uh, for the university for the student to pay. And uh, each campus has its own culture and uh, um, quality of teaching, clinical teaching, education uh, may be different. So have you done any study uh, on the effect of variation in the teaching, the quality of teaching, uh, yeah, we try to on do, students' performance. Also we absolutely try to years. do that too. For assessment of the teaching, we have been using in the clinical years uh, evaluation instrument called MedEd IQ. It's been used by 38 different medical schools to assess clinical teaching. Part of that, about half of the questions relate to the organization clerkship and then about half of it relates to the faculty so we look at that performance rating across the six campuses we look for variation between campuses and then in the terms of the knowledge base of students the big thing we have is the number what's the score on the NBME subject exams in each discipline across the six campuses and on the same campus within those same six disciplines on the same campus. So we statistically analyze every single year the evaluation by the students 
and the performance on the ambient units. Many years, there's absolutely no statistical differences between any of the disciplines or any of the campuses. When we have seen differences, we haven't seen trends. So that's, see, if I never saw a difference, I would think we're not using the right set of measures. We're not doing the right statistics. But we do see significant variations, sometimes across between campuses, sometimes between disciplines. But we haven't seen trends, and that's what I really watch for now. And occasional variations occurs. Sometimes when you look at it, you realize I could use this as a good example. Psychiatry on Sarasota always had among the highest numbers, had really good numbers. I think that clerkship director on that campus probably did a better job than his compatriots in that discipline. But many years, there's no difference between campuses or across the district. We look at those. That's how we look at our six regional campuses. So, uh, have you seen any correlation between these scores and their step two CS and CK scores? Uh, well, you, you can't see anything dealing with CS. See, CS has no yeah. score. Uh -huh. So you can't make any kind of judgment. Although, see, the students who fail the exam often, but not always, see, are students who have done poorly in their clinical years, but not always. We've had students who are AOA, I think with clinical skills, I would give this advice to your school, one that we're going to really put in place. We got to make sure our FOSCI is run, our OSCE and FOSCI is run exactly the way that the CS is given. And one of the big things that the CS does is the students go in for an encounter. They have 25 minutes. They totally control the clock. They have to walk out, and when they're done, they have to explain basically their logic in establishing differential diagnosis. And in talking to students, our students who fail, some of the really good students, they spend too much time working with a patient thinking that's what's important. But in fact, that note, I'm now convinced probably takes more value in the encounter with the patient, because the encounters aren't too difficult. But explaining your reasoning is a big deal. And if you run out of time, it can really cost you. So. I don't know what your school does, but our school is changing our format because we used to, we had a timer. They get 15 minutes with patients and 10 minutes to write up their notes. Now we're going to let them control the clock because they got to get that in their mind. But one of our best students, who actually one of the AOA students, failed the exam. And that's what she told me was her huge hit. She kept working with the patient and realized after a while she wasn't explaining their differential. So that's not we take, but it's a horrible thing to do these days with the match being so competitive. I have, I have a question. Um, why wait into the theater, like the student that was low? Yeah. There had to be factors in the first and second year to know that they were going to do poorly in a clerkship. Why? Well, I agree with you. Why wait until the third year I after agree with you. That's why as a student? We I'm got to work, we got to work harder in implementing the same scheme in years one and two. So we've learned so the lesson have now. To they are not going to do well. Yeah. You anecdotally, when you talk to the faculty, they will say, "I knew that student was weak in year one two. Well, who did you tell? And do you have evaluations and feedback that tells the administration that? Or now you can just show that you're real smart by saying, I knew that. <laughs> you, you got it. You got to convey that information. We don't do a wonderful job with it. And that's your challenge, too. Actually, one of the reasons why we invited you here is so that we, and by we, I'm looking around the room and we're mostly uh, the biomedical sciences faculty right. who teach in the first and second year, we may be able to create and adopt systems that help us with this early identification uh, and intervention strategy with more quantitative data. And I think this is worth uh, spending some additional time on perhaps after this particular um, um, season is over, maybe during the summer, where we can actually take a look at some of the ways that this is working in the third and fourth year. 
and try to see whether or not there are adaptations that we can include in the first and second year because that is a, a, where I think most of us say we kind of knew something was going on with this student. Um, I'm looking at David Thomas who gets involved with many of the students um, in terms of academic success and there are some indicators in first and second year. And then some of the things that you talked about, receptivity to learning, willingness to accept feedback, um, integrity, uh, communication skill, uh, willingness to work as part of a team with other students, those things, I think when we talk about the good students or the students that we like, there is a differentiation between just their grade and those other attributes. And um, it, tracking that, I think, would give us a, a beginning to the, a lot of these things that you're tracking in third and fourth year, besides the clinical. I agree with you 100%. See, as a person who teaches anatomy, where we spend so much in the time with students, we pick out some students too. But do we, do we pass that information on? Here's the other side of the coin, though. See, the students get frustrated when the faculty all they say is, good job. Or they'll, they'll say, oh, that's, a, that's okay job. See, but the student needs to be told real specifically what they're not doing by us who teach in the first two years, as well as those clinical faculty, because the faculty member, Jose, my friend Jose, who will, oh, good job. Honestly, I don't think he means it, but he doesn't dare say, you know, you just can't come to grips with a differential diagnosis. This is what you could do. He doesn't do any of that. It's just, good job. And some of our faculty, when you read their comments, see it's as superficial as what I just said. There are other faculty who really do a great job of pinpointing things. And then the student at least knows what to work on. And you're doing them a favor. You're not doing them a disservice. Find out their weaknesses. <coughs> What kind of lag time would you expect to see in improvement, say, if on their third rotation where you're starting to identify these deficiencies in students to implement something? When do you think they would, how long do you think, how many rotations before they're kind of back up to speed to the trajectory you would want? And, and maybe how that would correlate? It's really a difficult question, see, because some students will be able to work on something really concrete and they're trying to, they're, they're, they have the right motivation. So there's some who I, I'm sure if they were given direct guidance within a rotation period, they would change their performance. There's others, I don't care how careful you get it, they're going to continue to have it. So I don't know how to answer the question. But, but I, I hope that what we see this year with the campus dean is taking it real serious to do the media evaluation. I'm just really curious what's going to happen when we look at the end of the year. We have fewer people in that non-progressional group. Homes might not change a bit. I don't know. But we, we really had campus dean real serious about mid-year. And to put with it this year the Foskey data. I think Foskey just needs to be changed our own institution to a real thorough figure assessment. As that in the test setting of an OSCE to go along with the faculty evaluation draft workshops. Can you talk a little bit of, you, in your talk you mentioned this idea of feeding forward and sharing things with clerkship directors but not with the faculty. We do a similar thing in the first few years here where collectively we get together and we talk about some of the struggling students. Um, how vital do you think it is of getting the information just to the, to the course director, clerkship director versus identifying some maybe key faculty or personnel that could be working with the student as part of the courses? Well, it's a in a way, it's a dangerous area to be delving into because the LCMA standard doesn't want you to do things that potentially cr create bias against the student. So in the clerkships, it's pretty easy for us to rationalize, interpret things say, this way. If we put it in the hands of the education directors and the clerkship directors, 
have them assign appropriate faculty, but make sure that the clerkship director is told you can you cannot tell the faculty that you have major concerns. You could just point out, make sure you're thorough in your evaluation of XYZ, but for all students. If you create a situation where you pass on information that could be perceived as creating bias against the student, LCD standards say, tell us you can't do that. You've got to be careful with that. So it's just how you, I, I think as long as it's your course leadership, and you don't get it down to ones who would make their judgments of how the student acts in small groups, you're probably okay. It's a slippery slope. I have a question. Uh, by looking at your graph, certainly uh, based on this third, third rotation is a good time to evaluate how the students are doing, but why not the first one? Because the first one... Okay, so now you do... But the minimum, the minimum uh, meaningful uh, feedback could be done at the first time, but it's already the first right. picture mm -hmm. because most likely they say, okay, you are in the 40%, most likely you will have problem in the third rotation. So I was wondering... It's true. That. Again, your logic is good. It's just giving it all over my mind. But you're right. See, there's, it's going to come out of that group that you're going to find. Yes, it will come out of that group. This is probably a good place to take a break and uh, thank Dr. Romwell for reminding <laughs> people there's food out here. If you want to stop in and we're going to continue with discussion here, but it's um, um, we're tracking with exam scores, but often the issues are not exam scores. It's they're not coming in for help. We have an academic success team. Um, they try to work with the students, but the ones who are least successful seem to be not participating with help. And so we're getting issues of desire to learn and, and things like that. Uh, are they dependable? Are they showing up to lab? Are they coming in to... So we're doing tracking with those kind of things. And then we've got some support people that are trying to follow those students, and it could be our coordinators, it could be our academic success people, it could be the course directors. But they're starting to flag these students early on. And I'm wondering, you know, what your perceptions are of tracking students in the first two years, how you're really getting those students on the radar to know, you know, this is somebody that we need to deal with now before it goes too far. <clears throat> Again, it's a really complicated question. At Florida, University of Florida, I served on what we call the Academic Status Committee from one year after I arrived till the time I left in 2008. So really, I did it for 32 years. It was very common to find that the students who were struggling in years one and two were the same students we dealt with in years three and four. So we really need to be careful, this is my opinion, say, of ignoring information we have in years one and two. Because the further you get along with the student in their academic progression, as a near graduation, it's true at Florida State too, but I don't have I don't serve on that committee. But it's really hard for the committee to decide it's time to terminate the student really hard for them to say it when they get into their fourth year and now you still have some of these major concerns about confidence about their desire and dedication uh, this is truth in the, uh, divulging something right now we have a student who is now three years in the past three years past when he should have graduated and the school can't make the damn decision. And the debt sits there, see, but he was in trouble in year one. Should have been dealt with in year one. All I'm doing is restating the problem. It is a major problem. I think it's relatively rare that a student suddenly encounters major difficulties in three and four. However, there are exceptions where a student might have a serious medical problem 
are, are uh, divorced, had students with deaths in the family, it really shakes them emotionally. And when, when those kind of things occur, you really have to pull in quickly your support people who can handle that counseling and support that they need. But for the academic side, and especially people who really question their dedication and their interest in really doing this, some of you wonder how could they have even got past the interview because they don't seem to have the attributes that you would see in most medical students. All I would say is earlier you can identify and then you have your committee take appropriate action. Tough to do. Having served on academic status, status committee for a long time in Florida, it just amazed me how we would be making a decision I thought was so clear and people couldn't come to grips with. It. It's time to deal with the student in the ultimate way. Often the I, I actually have thought about writing a book, I'm really serious about this, about the wonders that occurred and they just didn't take action when they should have taken action. Often the feedback that we're getting that's most valuable isn't coming from faculty of course directors. It's often professionals in the education oh, team that are getting us information back and I'm wondering if do you have a way of capturing that and using it so that you're getting feedback to the students of, uh, related to the I wouldn't wait on time when you're questioning because I just gave a talk at our we have a biannual meeting of the clerkship director and the education director so we get everybody together and one of the questions I was asked was what are you doing to get a better evaluation from the staff and patients? Because we put in place a system to capture that data, but the variability you see between campuses is tremendous on compliance with doing it. But I fully agree, see, faculty have insights into the students. Sometimes students will act real respectful of faculty, but they'll turn around with the staff yeah. and show their, what I say are their true colors. And sometimes you see that too. Some of the staff will say they saw it in interactions with other people, and even they'll have comments from patients because we collect that information, but not in a systematic way. In resident education, we have 360 degree evaluations yes. that we're doing, and that's our staff, our front office staff, our clinical staff, our support staff. We're not doing patients yet with that, but you know, it's, it's anonymous. That's very interesting as a faculty advisor for residents to read through those comments. See, and then when you said anonymous, we do the same thing as anonymous. And then you really get in a difficult situation when you're dealing with you committee that's going to make big judgments, well, have you really got data you can rely on to do that? Staff I have no problem with, and I think the staff probably can do it, so at least you, it's labels coming from staff, but from patients, you never know. And when patients do it, and it's anonymous, and we, we even uh, know of cases where we think that students have doctored the data. We have no control over it. So your source of data has got to be something you can have confidence in. And staff, I, I am very sensitive to that. They see things that we as administrators and faculty do not see. That should be passed on. That attitude that comes across belligerent and disrespectful, documented. And then, see, somebody's got to take responsibility to give the feedback to the students unacceptable um, many many of our own faculty and even some administration aren't willing to give that kind of feedback that's our function sometimes it's the other way around sometimes we rate some students as below average and then you're surprised how much you get with the lesson at least that one then they excel in your team but if we take action against these students 
I mean, how do you deal with this? I know there's a simple answer to it. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the bridge program? I don't think that most of the faculty and staff here know about the bridge and talk about Florida why State. it was started. Yeah, Florida State, when it was established as a medical school, uh, it was at a time when there had not been a new medical school in the United States in 25 years. And so Florida State broke ground, and after Florida State became a new medical school, there have been about 25 other schools established, or possibly established right now in the United States. Uh, in the 90s, as probably some of you don't even know this, there was a feeling that the United States was pr producing too many physicians. So early 90s, cut back on enrollment in medical schools. Some schools even started to do it. And then by the late 90s, there was this sudden realization, wait a minute, with the aging of the population, and uh, the fact that as people get older, they need more medical care. So we really had a crisis coming in healthcare in the United States. So increased the enrollment in medical schools. So as that increase in enrollment occurred, existing medical schools increased in enrollment. New medical schools came on board. We've increased since uh, about 1990, about 30% the enrollment in medical schools. It's a big deal. The increase in the number of residency slots has been minuscule in comparison. So now we had this crisis occur, and it's occurred during the last three years, basically, where we have more U.S. graduates of our U.S. medical schools. We have more U.S. citizens going to offshore medical schools to be trained. We have more students who've gotten into osteopathic schools that want to go into allopathic residency programs. We have our own graduates who are trying to change between disciplines. About 5% see change disciplines after their first year of residency training. It's a major problem. We don't have enough slots. Florida State came on board in that period of time, though. Uh, as Florida State became a medical school, they justified establishing medical school in part not just by the numbers of future needs for physicians, but they looked at specifically this is a School is going to be established in the panhandle of Florida, where the rural counties are. This school is going to address the need for physicians in rural settings. It's going to be sensitive to the needs of the elderly. It's going to look at the needs of the underserved. And so the statutes that established in the state of Florida, Florida State Medical School, literally identified those three areas as part of the words in the law that established the medical school. Uh, the medical school actually had been forward thinking as they were doing their planning. They actually had a program for 20 or for 30 years where the students did their first year of training, 30 of them, on the Florida State campus and then transfers, transferred to Florida University of Florida Medical School. So I worked for a number of years coordinating between the two schools is my job in medical education. But see, the school was thinking, we've got to do something to meet those creative ideas we've had. So they created an outreach program called STRIDE, and they went into communities in many of these areas of rural counties in Florida and started talking to people about health-related careers, not just medicine, but encourage them to get into science and these other kinds of classes in middle school and high school so they'd be ready to consider a career in healthcare. It's a long-term planning program. They, they have a summer experience where they invite students to come and spend a week at the medical school and they introduce them again to options in healthcare. Along with that, They've looked at some of these students who are coming from with interest in healthcare professions, but who had weak credentials. They've been in college, see, but they came out of backgrounds where they may not have had as strong training. And so when they get into college, they may not end up with good MCAT scores in particular. 
they may not have strong science backgrounds. And so they decided they would create another pathway for some of these students who had no interest but didn't have the credentials to get into medical school. So the bridge program is a post-baccalaureate one-year program where students can come to the College of Medicine, do one year of post-baccalaureate work, and prove themselves worthy of being in medical school. And I wasn't part of this planning. It was in place before I got there. But they decided that uh, the anatomy course at Florida State was in the summer. And they would have these students do the summer gross anatomy course and the fall microanatomy course. And then they would do other courses to improve their skills and understand the concepts of statistics. And they would actually do a project <coughs> from a master's degree of independent research. And they did things to improve their study skills. So <coughs> the students who go through the bridge program, if they're successful, they enter medical school. And when they enter medical school, they repeat gross anatomy. They repeat microanatomy, and then they go through the rest of the medical curriculum. Uh, in the that program, the success rate of students once they are accepted into medical school, these kids come in with MCAT scores sometimes in the teens, total MCAT in the teens. Uh, most of them would not get an interview at any medical school. Uh, in the last few years, between 10 and 15 students in the last three years got into the bridge program. So there's that many students get into bridge. Uh, of the students who get into bridge, their success in medical school is about 96% are successful in complete, completing <coughs> medical school. I just compiled this data, so this number is really in my head. About a third of the students are male every one of those male students was by chance they completed medical school in four years every one of them uh, the women have had about uh, six to eight of them if i looked at my notes i could tell you exactly have taken an extra year or two some for health reasons some for others let's see some just took longer to get through, but the overall success rate is 96% complete medical school. Uh, our overall statistic on all the students get into medical school completed, and you probably know this, see nationally, it's around 98.5% of students get into medical school completed. Maybe to a fault, honestly, maybe to a fault. Our success rate is 98% of students get into medical school completed. A bridge program, high risk students, honestly, they wouldn't get an interview anywhere. Uh, these students who come through bridge, predominantly black and Hispanic, a few white, uh, a few Asian, but predominantly African American Hispanic. It helps us meet another mission because, especially the women, women who come through bridge, 80% go into primary care go to the school to produce primary care physicians to meet those health care needs and especially local communities. So that's, we're too early to know if we're really going to be successful in getting people into rural communities. But there's a national statistics you can look at. Uh, students who come from rural communities are much more likely to go back into rural communities. Uh, I can tell you for certainty, a student who comes out of Miami is not going to end up in a rural community <laughs> in Florida. It will never occur. When you look at people who are interested in going back into their communities and making a difference for people in their communities are people who come from those communities for the most part. So you want to be looking at a program where you can bring in the type, kind of students who you want to graduate. It's as simple as the formula is. That we been real simple. Bridge gives a benefit of a doubt to some students who have really excelled. Anecdotally, see, 
these are real numbers. For the class of 2014, a class I'm really proud of. See, I taught anatomy, so I got to know all the bridge students as they entered the program. I knew they came into the bridge. People downstream from me who didn't teach in that bridge year have no idea who they are. They don't put tattoos on their forehead or anything. They just blend with the class. And they fit really well. The class of 2014, uh, we had eight students enter the program that year with the class of 2014, and everyone graduated. So everyone graduated on time. That year, of those eight students, four of those eight who came through the bridge program were eligible for AOA, rated in the top 16% of their class. They didn't have the credentials to be there, if you believe the MCAT and the strength of their undergraduate training. Three of them got into AOA, one didn't, but not everybody gets into AOA who's eligible. Not one student was in the bottom third of the class of those bridge students. So I'm really proud of that group of students. Uh, the bridge students, they come in and take anatomy. They repeat it in its entirety. For that year, those students who came in and I spoke at graduation, see, so I know things about that class and I actually talked a little bit about the bridge program at graduation. Of those students who went through the bridge program, came into the end, of course, take the exam at the end of it, it's a national board exam, you know your percentile scores. For that class, uh, the students in the bridge program, when they took it as medical students, they averaged the 84th percentile. The top 16% in the nation see on that exam. I proudly tell these bridge students, you, you really will never look back at that stupid exam called the MCAT and think it judges your ability. Never give that a second thought. So after the bridge, uh, the, they complete the bridge program, are they required to take the MCAT again to enter medical no. school? No. No. Okay. It's done so. Uh, one other thing about the bridge scene. So they come in, they take anatomy, they repeat it as medical students. All of them see a blind.